Americ Rothschild. And I get, I'm fortunate enough to get to introduce most of today's honorees. The first will be Glenn Cramon, journalist, assistant managing editor of the New York Times, running an organization the size of the New York Times takes a person of limitless energy, high principle, and off the map people skills. Among other challenges facing Cremon are guiding journalists in their efforts to achieve the Pulitzer Prize. I know not if he's going to say something, something to that, but I would love to know the numbers. Uh, yesterday, I saw Glenn teach. It was magical. Glenn, come on up. <laughs> so I, I did teach yesterday, and of course, what they didn't tell me was that I taught an American history class, and Eric was in the class, so you can imagine I was traumatized. And fortunately, it wasn't in the old room 232, which is where Eric and Werner Feig, uh, well, I guess you guys, when you did it, uh, they did it downstairs, but Eric taught separately in 232, which we always refer to as using George Orwell Room 101, because you went in there and uh, you always said, do it to Julia, do it to somebody else. But they, he would put you on the spot and he would say, uh, he would force you to stand up and debate and you had to know your stuff. And in fact, I, I told the kids yesterday, and if you go to Scarsdale High, you're going to be well prepared for wherever you go to college. So um, I'm only the latest among about 50 New York Times people who were on that wall out there. Among them are Alan Schwartz, who those of you who have been following the national debate about sports concussions, particularly in football, and know Alan's name. I always say, you know what the number two sport for concussions is? What's this? Everybody knows football. What's the sport with a concussion rate almost as high as football? Boxing, golf. Soccer. soccer is right, but which soccer? Women's soccer, yeah. So he's done all kinds of concussions. Uh, Elizabeth Rosenthal, year behind, two years behind me, is now an international environmental writer and has done some of the most important environmental stories. And then, of course, Andrew Ross Sorkin needs no introduction. Uh, you see him on CNBC, now he's really famous. And uh, I hired him when he was 18 and a student at Scarsdale High School. I'm not kidding. And I've always said I'm going to work for Andrew someday. In fact, I think Andrew told me last week that someday would be next week. It may, it may be a little later than that. So I'm also the first to be able to cl claim that Eric, actually Jim Traub too, Eric was also my head counselor at Camp Androscoggin in, in Maine. And as a teenager, I was not too fond of sleeping in wooden cabins without plumbing or lights on a remote island. So in keeping with Eric's passion for American history, I always referred to Androscoggin as a combination of Andersonville, the Civil War prison camp, and Alcatraz. And of course, my parents didn't find that very funny. They were paying $1,000 a summer. Back then, that was big money. And they never appreciated my sense of humor. And of course, now, wouldn't we all kill to be able to spend a summer on a remote island in Maine? It's funny how that changes. <laughs> the people I remember from college, where I went to college, are my classmates. The people I remember from Scarsdale High School are the teachers. Eric, who was always on his feet with passionate enthusiasm, for his subject. I always say he was like when he, he was a, also a phenomenal tennis player and it was like he was on the tennis court. He was just moving around the classroom, just batting back everything we said, forcing us to engage and everybody still talks about him as their best teacher. But I also remember, does uh, anybody remember Ernest Painter, the English teacher, Marjorie Wheaton, the French teacher? Uh, my best, the only person who ever interested me in chemistry, Paul Tripp. Uh, okay, so there, there were some phenomenal teachers here. That, that's who stick with me. Uh, oh, and then Franklin Myers. 
English teacher. Terrific. And I remember my parents, my dad was so poor as a kid that uh, when he was selling newspapers on the street, one time it was a, on a really wintry night, he told me that uh, he had to wrap himself in the newspapers he was selling to stay warm. And he was so grateful to have made it to Scarsdale. I'm sure you all know stories like this. And then there was my mom who once spent an entire day driving from public library to public library in Westchester until she found for me the one book in the world on Lutess. And I'm, I'm not talking about the restaurant. I'm talking about the birthplace of Paris. We had a very sadistic seventh grade teacher who assigned us a report on Lutess, knowing that no one would find any, it was like a six page report, no one would find any information on it. This was well before Google. But my mother, the human search engine, found the one book the teacher gave me, saw my report, gave me an A plus, excuse me from class, we should all have mothers like this, and I'm sure there are mothers like this in the office, and fathers like this too, what they would do for their kids. Applying to college back then, 40 years ago, I'm class of 71, was not like what it is today. So guess, I asked the class this yesterday too, guess what percentage of applicants to Stanford University were accepted in the 1960s? Guesses? 25. 40. What was that? 16. 62. 20. 62. 62% were accepted. Uh, that's two out of three. My cra the craziest thing is that my boss, the brightest editor I ever worked for, Bill Keller, just stepped down as executive editor, rejected at Stanford. It just doesn't make any sense. They would have, applying from New York, I could have easily asked them for a plane ticket and they would have paid for it. It's just changed so much. So uh, I applied there because my baseball hero, Willie McCovey, played for the nearby San Francisco Giants. I, I didn't even know that it was co-ed. Uh, the day I was accepted, I wrote in my journal, got accepted to Stanford, watched Rangers beat Blackhawks. <laughs> I never mentioned the place again in my journal until the day I set foot on campus. I was, what an idiot I was. Uh, Stanford proved the making of me. Now my daughter was there among the lucky 7%. She's much smarter than I am. Scarsdale High made Stanford seem easy, and from college I worked my way through journalism to the best job in the world. I oversee hundreds of reporters and editors at the New York Times, encouraging them to do stories that make the world a better place. The Eleanor, I love that Eleanor Roosevelt story, and that's exactly what I tell them. I tell them that our audience is you guys, and you guys have the power to change. We, we, are, we only have uh, probably, when we have a very well-read story, million and a half views. The biggest uh, video on YouTube, Charlie Bit Me. Has anybody heard of this video, Charlie Bit Me? Half a billion views. But I say those 1.5 million views are really powerful people who can change the world. So if you lead them in the right direction, they can make an enormous difference. Alan Schwartz's work on concussions is one example. Perhaps my favorite was our work on the safety and environmental dangers of sport utility vehicles, which inspired the redesign of millions of vehicles, which in turn has saved many thousands of lives over the past decade. I'll finish by saying, what stories do you think the New York Times should be doing next? I'd welcome your thoughts later today by email beyond that. Meanwhile, thank you for very much for admitting me to this very extraordinary club. Ricardo, Kelly, thank you. All of you are involved in this. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you very much. That was great. That was great. Oh, OK. Yeah. Oh, goodness. OK. Little, I get my times out of the way. Yeah. <laughs> All right. You got it? Okay, thank you, sir.